What is going on? Hello, everybody, friends, family. Beautiful people from around the world. I am here to continue doing a wee bit of reading from the Sutra of Hua Nang. And I left off kind of in the middle of chapter seven. <clears throat> so I'll just read a few more pages. You know what, let's roll the windows down. Let some of that nice one air come in. See, beautiful out there. <clears throat> one day, Chi Chiang asked the patriarch, Buddha preaches the doctrine of three vehicles and also that of a supreme vehicle. As I do not understand this, will you please explain? The patriarch replied, in trying to understand these, you should introspect your own mind and act independently of things and phenomena. The distinction of these four vehicles does not exist in the Dharma itself, but in the differentiation of people's minds to see, to hear, and to recite the Sutra is the small vehicle. To know the Dharma and to understand its meaning is the middle vehicle. To put the Dharma into actual practice is the great vehicle. To understand thoroughly all Dharmas, to have absorbed them completely, to be free from all attachments, to be above phenomena and to be in possession of nothing is the supreme vehicle. Since the word yana, vehicle, implies motion, i.e. putting into practice, argument on this point is quite unnecessary. All depends on self-practice, so you need not ask me any more. But I may remind you that, at all times, the essence of mind is in a state of thusness. Chi Chi Ang made obeisance and thanked the patriarch. Henceforth, he acted as his attendant until the death of the master. Bhikshu Chi Tao, a native of Nanhai of Guangdong, came to the patriarch for instruction saying, since I joined the order, I have read the Mahaparinivrana Sutra more than 10, for more than 10 years but I have not yet grasped its main idea. Will you please teach me? Which part of it do you not understand? Asked the patriarch. It is about this part, sir, that I am doubtful. All things are impermanent, and so they belong to the Dharma of becoming and cessation i.e. Samskrita Dharma. When both becoming and cessation cease to operate, the bliss of perfect rest and cessation of changes, i.e. Nirvana, arises. What makes you doubt? asked the patriarch. All beings have two bodies the physical body, and the Dharma Kaya, replied Chao Chi, Chi Tao. 
The former is impermanent, it exists and dies. The latter is permanent, it knows not and feels not. Now the sutra says, when both becoming and cessation cease to operate, the bliss of perfect rest and cessation of changes arises. I do not know which body ceases to exist and which body enjoys the bliss. It cannot be the physical body that enjoys because when it dies, the four material elements, earth, water, fire, and air, will disintegrate. And disintegration is pure suffering and the, the very opposite of bliss. And it is the Dharma Kaya that ceases to exist. It would be in the same state of inanimate objects such as grass, trees, stones, and so on. Who will then be the enjoyer? Moreover, Dharma nature is the quintessence of becoming and cessation which manifests as the five skandhas, rupa, vedana, samjna, samskara, and vijnana. That is to say, with one quintessence, there are five functions. The process of becoming and cessation is everlasting. When function or operation arises from the quintet quintessence it becomes when the operation or function is absorbed back into the quintessence it ceases to exist if reincarnation is admitted there would be no cessation of changes as in the case of sentient beings if we are if reincarnation is out of the question then things will remain forever in a state of lifeless quintessence, like inanimate objects. If this is so, then under the limitations and restrictions of nirvana, even existence will be impossible at all to all beings. What enjoyment could there be? You are, son, you are a son of Buddha, a bhikshu, said the patriarch. So why do you adopt the fallacious views of eternalism and annihilationalism held by the heretics and criticize the teaching of the supreme vehicle? Your argument implies that apart from the physical body, there is a law body, dharmakaya, and that perfect rest and cessation of changes may be sought apart from becoming and cessation. Further, from the statement, nirvana is everlasting joy, you infer that there must be somebody to play the part of the enjoyer. Now, it is exactly these fallacious views that make people crave for sensate existence and indulge in worldly pleasure. It is for these people, the victims of ignorance, who identify the union of the five skandhas as the self and regard all other things as not self literally outer sense objects. Who crave for individual existence and have an aversion to death. Who drift about in the whirlpool of life and death without realizing the hollowness of mundane existence which is only a dream or an illusion, who commit themselves to unnecessary suffering by binding themselves to the will 
of rebirth who mistake the state of everlasting joy of nirvana for a mode of suffering and who are always after sensual pleasure. It is for these people that the comp compassionate Buddha preached the real bliss of nirvana. At any one moment, nirvana has neither the phenomenon of becoming, nor that of cessation, nor even the ceasing of operation of becoming and cessation. It is the manifestation of perfect rest and cessation of changes, but at the time of manifestation, there is not even a concept of manifestation. So it is called the everlasting joy, which has neither enjoyer nor non-enjoyer. There is no such thing as one quintessence and five functions, as you allege. And you are slandering Buddha and blaspheming the law when you state that under such limitation and restriction of nirvana existence is possible to all beings. Listen to my stanza. The supreme Mahaparanirvana is perfect, permanent, calm, and illuminating. The ignorant people miscall it death, while heretics hold that it is annihilation. Those who belong to the Shravaka vehicle or the Pratikaya Buddha vehicle regard it as non-action. All these are mere intellectual speculations and form the basis of the 62 fallacious views, since they are mere fictitious names invented for the occasion they have nothing to do with the absolute truth. Only those of super eminent mind can understand thoroughly what nirvana is and take up the attitude of neither attachment nor indifference toward it. They know that five skandhas and the so-called ego arising from the union of these skandhas together with all external objects and forms and the various phenomena of sound and voice are equally unreal like a dream or an illusion. They make no discrimination between a sage and an ordinary man, nor do they have any arbitrary concept of nirvana. They are above affirmation or negation, and they break the barrier of the past, the present, and the future. They use their sense organs when occasion requires, but the concept of using does not arise. They may particularize all, on all sorts of things, but the concept of particularization does not arise even during the cataclysmic fire at the end of a kalpa, when ocean beds are burned dry, or during the blowing of the catastrophic wind when one mountain topples on another. The real and everlasting bliss of perfect rest and cessation of changes of nirvana remains in the same state and changes not. Here I am trying to describe to you something that is ineffable so that you may get rid of your fallacious views. But if you do not interpret my words real, literally, you may perhaps learn a wee bit of the meaning of nirvana. Having heard the stanza, Chitao was highly enlightened in a rapturous mood, he made obeisance and departed. 
Bichu Sing Su, a Dhyana master, was born at Ancheng of Chi Yi Chao of a Lu family. Upon hearing that the preaching of the patriarch had enlightened a great number of people, he at once came to Si A Chai to tender him homage and to and ask him this question What should a learner direct his mind to so that his attainment cannot be rated by the usual stages of progress? What work have you been doing? asked the patriarch. Even the noble truths taught by various Buddhas, I have not anything to do with, replied Sing Su. What stage of progress are you in? asked the patriarch. What stage of progress can there be when I refuse to have anything to do with even the noble truths? He retorted. His repartee commanded the great respect of the patriarch, who made him the leader of the assembly. One day the patriarch told him that he should propagate the law in his own district so that the teaching might not come to an end. Thereupon he returned to Chi Ying Yuan Mountain in his native district. The Dharma having been transmitted to him, he spread it widely and thus perpetuated the teaching of his master upon his death. The posthumous title, Dhyana Master Hong Chi, was conferred on him. Okay. I'll go through another little bit. Bikshu Hua Zheng, a Dhyana master, was born of a two family in Qin Chu. Upon his first visit to national teacher Hua An of Sung Shan Mountain, he was, he was directed by the latter to go to Sao A Chi Yi to interview the patriarch. Upon his arrival and after the usual salutation, he was asked by the patriarch whence he came. From Sung Shan, replied he, what thing is it that comes? How did it come? asked the patriarch. To say that it is similar to a certain thing is wrong, he retorted. Is it attainable by training? asked the patriarch. It is not impossible to attain it by training, but it is quite impossible to, to pollute it, he replied. Thereupon the patriarch exclaimed, It is exactly this unpolluted thing that all Buddhas take good care of. It is so for you, and it is so for me as well. Patriarch, Prajnadahara of India foretold that under your feet a cult would rush forth and trample on the people of the whole world. I need not interpret this or oracle too soon as the answer should be found within your mind. Being thereby enlightened, Hua Ai Zhang realized intuitively what the patriarch had said. Henceforth he came, he became his attendant for a period of 15 years. And day by day his knowledge of Buddhism got deeper and deeper. Afterward, he made his home in Nanhue, where he spread widely the teaching of the patriarch. Upon his death, the posthumous title, Dhyana Master Tao Hue, Great Wisdom, was conferred on him by Imperial Edict.
<clears throat> Excuse me. Diana Master Swan Chu of Chu of Hong Chi was born of a Thai family in Wen Chow. As a youth, he studied sutras and shastras and was well versed in the teaching of shamatha, inhibition, inhibition and quietude, and vipa shayana, contemplation or discernment of the TNTI school. Through the reading of the Vimala Kirti Nirdisha Sutra, he realized intuitively the mystery of his own mind. The disciple of the patriarch by the name of Xuan Zizi Yi happened to pay him a visit. During the course of a long discussion, Xuan Zizi Yi noticed that the utterance of his friend agreed virtually with the, the sayings of the various patriarchs. Thereupon he asked, May I know the name of your teacher who transmitted the Dharma to you? I had teachers to instruct me, replied Swan Chui. When I studied the sutras of the Shastras of the Vipulya section, but afterward it was through the reading of the Vimala Kirti Nirdesh Sutra that I realized the significance of the Buddha Chitta Buddha mind and have not yet had any teacher to verify and confirm my knowledge. Before the time of Bhisma Garjitishvara Raja Buddha, Huswans remarked, it is possible to dispense with the service of a teacher, but since that time, he who attains enlightenment without the aid and the confirmation of a teacher is a natural heretic. Will you, will you, sir, kindly act as my testifier? Asked Xuan Chu. My words carry no weight, replied his friend. But in Sao Ao Chi Yi, there is the sixth patriarch to whom visitors in great numbers come from all directions with the common object of having the Dharma transmitted to them. Should you wish to go there, I shall be pleased to accompany you. In due course, they arrived at Sao Chiu Yi and interviewed the patriarch. Having circumambulated, circumambulated the patriarch thrice, Swan Chu stood still, i.e., without making obeisance to the master with the Buddhist staff in his hand. The patriarch remarked, as a Buddhist monk is the embodiment of 3,000 moral precepts and 80,000 minor disciplinary rules, I wonder where you come from and what makes you so conceited. The question of incessant rebirths is a monotonous one, replied he. And as death may come at any moment, I have no time to waste on ceremony. Why do you not realize the principle of birthlessness? and thus solve the problem of the transiency of life, the patriarch retorted. Thereupon, Huxuan Chu remarked, <coughs> to realize the essence of mind is to be free from birth, rebirths. And once this problem is solved, the question of transiency no longer exists. That is so, that is so, the patriarch agreed. At this stage, Huswan Chu gave in and made obeisance in full ceremony. After a short, short while, he bid the patriarch adieu.
You are going away too quickly, aren't you? asked the patriarch. How can there be quickness when motion intrinsically exists not? he retorted. How can there be quickness? Oh, I already said that. Who knows that motion exists not? asked the patriarch. I hope you, sir, will not particular eyes, he observed. The patriarch commended him for his thorough grasp of the motion of birthlessness. But Swan Chu remarked, is there a notion in birthlessness? Without a notion, who can particularize? asked the patriarch. That which particularizes is not a notion, replied Hu Xuan Chu. Well said, exclaimed the patriarch. And then he then asked Hu Xuan Chu to delay his departure and spend the night there. Henceforth, Hu Xuan Chu was known to his contemporaries as the enlightened one who had spent a night with the patriarch. Afterward, he wrote a famous work, A Song on Spiritual Attainment, which circulates widely. His post-humorous post title is Grand Master Wu Hussein. He who is above form or phenomena, and he was also called by his contemporaries, Diana Master Chen Chao, he who is re really enlightened. Okay, I am going to stop there. Still on chapter seven with uh, just four-ish more pages to go.